Hello friends, I am Professor Ajay Khanna from the Department of General Surgery, Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras in the University of Varanasi. Today I will be discussing about the swellings of the neck and that too the cystic swellings of the neck. You know there are so many swellings which are there in the neck but today I will be discussing only the cystic swellings of the neck. The cystic swellings of the neck can be divided into various categories. They can be congenital, they can be inflammatory or infective, sometimes they can be neoplastic also, then the vascular variety and they may be traumatic. Now in the group of the congenital, the thyroglossal cyst, the branchial cleft cyst, dermoids and epidermoid cyst and the ranula. While in the inflammatory type, it is mainly because of some infection, especially in the tuberculosis where there can be a, like a cold abscess may be there which may present as a cystic swelling in the neck. Then the neoplastic variety, sometimes the lymph nodes which are there, they may become cystic and give an impression of a cystic swelling. A thyroid cancer may be presenting like a cystic swelling and then HPV related human papilloma virus related squamous cell carcinoma which are there and their nodal metastasis may be also like a cystic swellings. And then there can be the vascular swellings like the lymphatic swelling like a lymphangioma or a cystic hygroma and then it can be sometimes after the trauma like there is a lymph collection is there what is called a lymphocele or there may be seroma may be there. So today I will be discussing about the main true cystic swellings of the neck and they are thyroglossal cyst, branchial cleft cyst, dermoids and the epidermoids, the ranula, cystic hygromas and sometimes the epidermal cyst. Now if you look at the location of the cystic swelling, the ranula, the thyroglossal cyst and the dermoid cyst, usually they come in the midline while the branchial cyst and the lymphangioma which are there, they are on the lateral side. Now first is the thyroglossal cyst. Now basically a thyroglossal cyst is a type of the tubulo embryonic dermoid. It is found along the tract which is left over by the thyroid gland when it was descended from the foramen cecum and they are lined by the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar or squamous epithelium and that is why there can be like the mucus secretion which you can see in a patient with the thyroglossal cyst. Now majority of the patients of the thyroglossal cyst, they present before the age of 10 years and the commonest location of the thyroglossal cyst is below the hard bone but they can be present at the level of the hard bone or they can be even the supra hard position also may be there for a thyroglossal cyst. Usually they are midline but slightly on the left side they may occur especially on the lower part if it is a below the hoid bone swelling is there they may be slightly on the left side. They are soft, cystic and fluctuant and the translimination is negative. Now the typical cyst which is there it is deep to or it may be embedded in the infrahoid strap muscles and as I told you the more inferior the cyst is there it is more likely to be off the midline usually on the left side. Now one of the very important diagnostic feature of a thyroid cyst is 
the movement with the protrusion of the tongue. As you know that the third swelling, it moves with the deglutition. But this swelling will move with the deglutition as well as protrusion of the tongue. So you hold the swelling and ask the patient to protrude the tongue and you will feel a, like a tug is there. And if you find that tug is there, this is a sign of a thyrogorsal cyst. Now, for making the diagnosis, you can do ultrasound of that and ultrasound will show a smooth, well circumscribed lesion may be there, anechoic lesion. Similarly, on the CT scan, you can find a well circumscribed lesion, which is thin walled with the fluid attenuation. And in MRI, on the T2 weighted sequence, it has got the hyper intense and in the signal intensity of the T1 weighted image is likely variable due to the difference in the cystic content which is there. So by simple ultrasound you can make a diagnosis of a cystic swelling. Now this thyroid of the cyst may have few complications like it may get infected. And because of the infection, there may be a formation of a thyroglossal fistula may be there. Then, in about 1% case, it may develop the papillary type of the thyroid carcinoma. And that is why you have to be very careful in following these patients that this type of the carcinoma may not develop in a thyroglossal cyst. Now, majority of the time, the treatment of this cyst is the excision. But one should make sure that, that this is not only a functioning thyroid tissue. Because sometimes what happens that this will be presenting like a small swelling, like a thyroid cyst. And that may be the only functioning thyroid tissue may be there. So it is advisable sometimes that you should do a thyroid scan to make sure that this is not only the viable functioning tissue because if it is the only one then you will not excise it. But majority of the time that situation is not there. So the treatment for a thyroid or a cyst what is classically called as cyst trunks operation where you do the excision of the cyst by the elliptical incision which is made and in way because this track which is there which goes up to the foramen cecum is attached to the hoid bone. So in majority of the cases you have to remove the central part of the hoid bone. If you do not remove it there is a chance of the recurrence is there. Then sometimes nowadays for all the cystic swellings of the neck one can try the sclerotherapy you can inject certain sclerotherapy in that like you can inject the OK532 in that you can inject the sodium tetradesis sulfate all these things can be injected and in a good number of the cases you can get a good response. Now the next is the branchial cyst. Now branchial cyst is basically a remnant of the embryonic development and it is because of the failure of the obliteration of the branchial cleft. As you know, there are six branchial arches which are there and they fuse with each other and if they are not getting obliterated, there is a chance of the branchial cyst formation or sometimes the branchial fistula formation may be there. So it can result in a cyst in about 75% cases or a sinus or a fistula in about 25% cases. Now out of these six, the most common anomaly which is there is the second branchial arch almost about 95% of the lesions because the second branchial arch they can lead to the branchial cyst formation. Now there are basically four types of the branchial cyst which are there in the neck depending upon the location. The type 1 is it occurs anterior to the sternocleidomastoid just deep to the platysma muscle. 
type 2 is a commonest variety like this one which is there is the commonest variety it occurs deep to the sternocleidum astoid and lateral to the carotid space the type 3 it extends medially between the bifurcation of the internal and external carotid arteries to the lateral pharyngeal wall the type 4 is occurs in the pharyngeal mucosal space medial to the carotid sheath but majority of the time when we are dealing with the neck swelling for the branchial this is the type 2 which is there which is situated in this upper part of the neck on the lateral side usual age of presentation is from 15 to 30 years this is the common location as i told you at the anterior medial border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the junction of the upper third and the middle third so at this point you get the branchial cyst usually the patient is asymptomatic for that but if this infection is there it can get painful so they are soft cystic non transparent and one of the very important characteristic of branchial cyst is that if you aspirate these cyst you can reveal the cholesterol crystals may be there now branchial cyst on ultrasound there are thick walls or sometimes you can get the internal septations or the echoes may be there and the ct scan will show a well circumscribed non enhancing lesion of homogeneous low attenuation there may wall thickening and enhancement because of the associated inflammation what is the treatment for the branchial cyst the treatment is the excision you usually make a incision like this which is along the skin crease a transverse incision and then you excise the branchial cyst again a sclerotherapy can be used as i told you about the ok and the sodium tetrahydrosyl sulfate can be injected in the branchial cyst also with a good success rate the complication is the infection which may lead to a sinus formation in the upper part here then third is the ranula now ranula basically is a cystic lesion of the floor of the mouth usually it occurs secondary to the obstruction of the sublingual duct it is like an retention cyst and why it is called as ranula because it mimics like the belly of the frog you know the rana variety of the hexadactyla variety which is there of the frog it mimics like that now ranulas can be simple ranula where it is on the floor of the mouth but sometimes it can go down into the submandibular space then it is called the plunging type or the diving type of the ranula so you can have simple ranula just under the floor in the floor of the mouth underneath the tongue or you can have a swelling which is there in the submandibular area that is called a plunging type of the ranula so rarely ranulas can dissect across the midline usually they are on one side of the midline between the mylohyoid and geniohyoid muscles to present as a bilateral mass so usually it is on one side but sometimes they can be bilateral and even the giant ranulas are there there may be huge ranulas which may be there which may even be extending to the parapharyngeal space and have a narrow tail that extends through the sublingual space and sometimes these giant one can cause the symptoms of the pressure symptoms may be there so usually they present in the young children and adults location as i told you they are under the tongue on the floor of the mouth on one side they are soft cystic fluctuant and very important they are brilliantly transparent so this transformation which is there it differentiated from the other swellings like there may be a sublingual dermoid may be there which is not transparent usually they look bluish in color and as i told you the plunging where there will be swelling like this as well as swelling like this will be there that is called as a plunging ranula and in the plunging ranula you can do the cross fluctuation so you can put 
one finger here and one finger here and look for the cross fluctuation. Diagnosis, you can do the ultrasound. Ultrasound again, there will be unilocular well-defined cystic lesion will be there in the submental space. It may contain the fine internal echoes. The CT scan, there may be over shaped cyst may be there, usually of the Hounsfield field of 10 to 20. And MRI also will show a low signal intensity on T1 weighted while high signal intensity on the T2 weighted sequence. So what is the treatment of the ranula? Treatment is to carry out the complete excision of that. Many times it may not be possible to completely excise. So you can do the marsupialization that you open the cyst and then you suture it over the floor of the mouth. Or sometimes again, a sclerotherapy. For all the cystic swellings in the neck, you can try for the sclerotherapy. The differential diagnosis of the ranula, as I told you, is a sublingual dermoid, but it is not transparent. And complications, it may rupture, or sometimes the large is the giant ranulas which are there can cause difficulty in the speech and even the swallowing. The fourth one is lymphangioma. Now, lymphangiomas, they arise from the early sequestration of the embryonic lymphatic channels, most commonly developing along the jugular chain, so you get in the neck. There are four types of lymphangioma which are described. It can be cystic hygroma, usually that is for the neck, cavernous lymphangioma, capillary lymphangioma, and vasculolymphatic malformation. All these are the varieties of the lymphangiomas. And what are the common sites? Neck is the common site. Then it may extend from the neck to the axilla or even to the mediastinum or the groin or in the retroperitoneum, you can get the lymphangioma. Now, usually in the when it is in the neck, it is called as a cystic hygroma. Usually present at infancy, even at birth, it can be there and may sometimes cause the obstructed labor or in the early childhood, they are soft, cystic, partially compressible. And this is also brilliantly transparent. So this, apart from the ranula, which is brilliantly transparent, this swelling is also brilliantly transparent. So cystic hyaluroma is the most common type of the lymphangiomas. 75% they occur in the neck, usually in the posterior triangle or in the submandibular space. They may be infiltrative, they may infiltrate into the various facial plane and sometimes it may extend to the mediastinum and to the axilla and if sometimes there can be sudden enlargement may be there, that may suggest that it is the hemorrhage or infection is there in the cyst. Ultrasound will show the multilocular cystic masses will be there with septations. CT to the poorly circumscribed multilocular masses which are there. And MRI will show the low signal intensity on T1 weighted and hyper intensity of the T2 weighted images. The treatment is the surgical excision as far as possible, but many times because there are rice seeds appearance means the small small micro loculi which are there they will be entering into the surrounding muscles so it is sometimes very difficult to exercise but you should try as far as possible all the loculi and cysts must be exercised and then sclerotherapy is very good sclerotherapy has been used extensively for this and you get a good result in the case of the cystic hygroma and complications that the infection is there and the pressure symptoms it may be causing because of large size the patient may present with the respiratory symptoms or the deglutition problem. Then is the sublingual dermoid cyst here. Now the reason for a cystic swelling to be because you have to differentiate it from the ranula that is the most important thing. It's a type of a sequestration dermoid. You know, there are various type of the dermoids which are there. This is a sequestration dermoid. 
usually present at the age of 10 to 20 years. They are soft cystic in midline or maybe lateral also. You can do the bi-digital palpation of this dermoid cyst. They are non-transparent versus the ranula, as I told you, which is brilliantly transparent. There are no hairs. You know, most of the time the dermoids, they have the hairs, but there are no hairs here. And differential diagnosis is the ranula and the thyroglossal cyst. And treatment is, again, to go for the excision of that. You can do intraoral excision or the extraoral incision can be carried out if there is a big mass which is there. And then finally, the epidermal cyst, commonly called as the sebaceous cyst, which is a retention cyst. It occurs because of suction of the sebaceous duct. It is just under the skin and the typical black spot is there, what is called the punctum, which is at the site of the blocked sebaceous duct. And at this point, you would find that you cannot pinch the skin over that. And you can indent this sometimes because there is a putty type of material which is inside that. You can do the indentation of this swelling and the treatment for this is that to go for the avulsion or preferably the excision of the cyst so that to avoid the recurrence of the if you leave the wall then there is a chance of recurrence is there so thank you very much today i have dealt only about the true cystic swellings as i told you there can be many presentation like a cyst in the neck but this discussion is only for the true cyst of the neck. Thank you very much.